<laughs> All right, I think they're getting us going and getting us started. And there was light. Um, I'm John Gruber with F5 Networks. I'm in our product management. This is... Rick Masters, and I'm in our architecture group. I'm a senior director of product development. So when we talk about OpenStack things, um, obviously the networking component of OpenStack was very, very important to us, but you also see things that involved compute. You saw all sorts of things to range the whole catalog of things. The first time F5 published solutions with OpenStack was for Neutron LBAS, and it was last year that we came out and said, hey look, an LBAS solution should be flexible no matter what your deployment was. Because we saw a bunch of LBAS solutions that um, could do very well if they were running in compute, could not do very well if they were to graft into OpenStack as a network device. So we talked a lot about that. And we'll continue to talk about that. Because one of the functions that is a necessity is to run LBAS in a multi-tenant way. We all know that OpenStack supports multi-tenancy, right? We all know that that tenant model is very well defined. Um, if you think about the resource consumption of a load balancer, there are many, 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 many use cases where it makes no sense to burn all those resources to launch one VIP. There are also use, use cases where you have to deploy where for us it made sense to concentrate a bunch of time to be able to give you load balancing across our, our catalog. Because think about OpenStack itself. OpenStack itself was built as a framework that could be deployed in many different ways to support many different workloads, right? Sometimes launching a multi-tenant virtual edition of our appliance and doing uh, tunneling from that to do multi-tenancy was what made sense. Sometimes running clusters of our appliances makes sense. Sometimes we have customers whose operations have had active standby big IPs forever. Uh, sometimes you need scale up. If you think about load balancing for a second, the scale out of the pool makes sense to everybody. You connect to a VIP, you scale out to a bunch of pool members. But what happens when you need to scale up the VIP? What happens when you have use cases that legitimately call for a VIP at 40 gig? What could you do? That's why it was very important for F5 to say that our LBAS solutions for OpenStack supported our entire product line, including our own virtualized appliances, our VCMP instances. So we spent a bunch of time and a bunch of work to make sure that when you got LBAS from F5, you didn't get a VE LBAS. You got an F5 LBAS across our product lines and across our product offerings because your workloads may not make sense to run in a VE. Your workloads may make sense to something where the 100th connection connects at the same reliability and with the same timing as the millionth. OpenStack should support those ecosystems and network setups and workloads. So should we. Now, that didn't mean we were stuck with multi-tenancy. We can also do single-tenant LBAS. So for the use case where you just wanted to launch a VE and you want to hand it off to that tenant, can the LBAS solution work with it? Yes. Do we have solutions that are smart enough to know the difference? Yes. So our LBAS at, at this point, if you launch it and a tenant makes a request for a load balancing service, it can be intelligent enough to sit there and say, does that tenant have F5 load balancers launched as VEs in their tenant? If they do, make the load balancing service provision their single tenant load balancers. If they don't, go to the multi-tenant solutions. Go to the things that are registered for multi-tenancy. Again, your workloads your way because OpenStack was about being flexible, being deployable in multiple cloud environments. One of the other things that we highlighted last year is, guess what? SDN's a critical component in OpenStack, right? So your big IPs are VTEPs. Now what does that mean? That means that it's not just a load balancer, it is now a full-fledged VTEP as part of the Neutron network, which means we have to update FIB tables. When you add a, when you add a, a you know, you add your guest over here, we have this beautiful service called L2 Populate. Well, now we have to pay attention to it like we were an L2 solution and be able to graph those things in as a VTEP. 
Now get this. This is something that, that Rick and I spent a lot of time looking at some of the core vendors and said, no, 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 no. Our VE is an, a VTEP, right? Which is a little unusual. Which was unusual, but we're like, no, you need to support that. Can we launch some VEs up there in a multi-tenant fashion, go right through the security groups because the VTEP's the address it's routing to and still support that device having a bunch of multi-tenant tunnels on top of it? Yes. Can you do multi-tenancy with us with just VEs? Yes. It is a VTEP that joins into the network with your compute nodes. That was the heavy lifting, because again, the point was ADC the way you wanted to see it in your specific OpenStack cloud to support your workloads. Does that make sense to everybody? You see why it's a little larger definition than saying I can launch a VE and put a VIP on it? There's a lot involved. Now, we know that VEs are very important, specifically to NFV. So on our virtual edition, so on our software-based virtual editions, we knew there was a lot of things we had to do to be able to, to take advantage of the ecosystem that is OpenStack. OpenStack provides a tremendous amount of information about those Nova instances, right? I can tag them with metadata. I can do all sorts of good things. Now, the first thing we had to do was, like a lot of network vendors, we have a virtual appliance. Does that make sense? It's a virtual appliance, which means there's some black box nature to it because it, you, you ship it as an appliance. It's not an Ubuntu or CentOS image that you add packages to. Now, there's a reason for that. We have security certifications. We've got all sorts of hardening we've done. There's all sorts of pieces. But when you go to downloads.f5.com, you see virtual edition, this speed, this stuff, when our marketing terms and our stuff and all these things. So one of the first things we had to do was translate. Translate into OpenStack speak. Because to use our virtual edition, should you, be ex should you have to be experts on F5 marketing speak and licensing speak? No. You should be an OpenStack person. So one of the things we did is translate those into appropriate glance images and appropriate flavors. Do you know why you need unique flavors for ADCs? Because they're unique workloads, right? Could you deploy an ADC and because you picked the standard flavor, be very inefficient in your cloud? Yes. So do you need to see the flavors that match to the ADC workloads? Yes. So we did that work. There's also this notion of high availability in your load balancer. How many want a single point of failure load balancer? Right. Um, F5 platforms support clustering. Now, those clustering, like to put that cluster in, that's an exercise that we normally shake hands with our lovely certified F5 engineer and the engineer knows how to set up our clusters and do all that work, and they say, yes, I can get that done. And there's a thousand knobs you can tune a thousand ways to get it to work right. In OpenStack, because we know so much about the environment, we can put it all together for you and build those clusters for you on the fly. And that's the work we've done. Now, what kind of workloads? 20 meg, 200 meg, one gig, three gig instances, those all pretty much can work as sitting on top of most software networking solutions. But I'm going to ask, how well are the vSwitches working at higher speeds, 5 gig and 10 gig? How are we doing? What, Rick, what, what, did, what did Neutron add in Juno? SRIOV. So you think we should do that? Of course we should do that. <laughs> so do you have SRIOV support in your software load balancer? You should. And we have SRV support to get you to the 5 gig and the 10 gig instances of our software appliances. Does that make sense? All stuff the community supports, all stuff that we should track. Now, there's also this notion that not all network implementations of Neutron look the same. Do you appreciate that? We go with the stock. We go with the reference implementation with OVS or Linux Bridge. We've got all this data we can collect and do stuff. We work with the particular SDN controller, and maybe those Neutron extensions aren't supported. Not if you understand what I'm talking about. There can be a lot of source of truth issues about where things are. 
For instance, I want you to think about a complex cluster setup of virtual editions across three different compute nodes. This is just the network part. All I did is say, hey, I'd like a load balancing VIP. Great. What's that mean? Well, that means we have a lot of dynamic, on-the-fly, multi-tenant L2 binding to every device. Depending on how you set it up, I could have two legs, I could have five legs, I could have 100 legs. Now, is your load balancer an L2 device? No. It's actually higher than that. It goes up the stack. So do I need to graft L3 onto those L2? And by the way, does Neutron give me subnets and all, that, all the IPAM data? Sure it does. So should I be able to do that? Yes. So there's L3 bindings. Well, what all does that mean? Well, that means I have to give things fixed addresses for the cluster. I have to go through things. How many people know that snap pools should travel with cluster addresses for high availability so you don't have connection failures when you have a failover device? Or how many people know that you'd like to have more connections than, 60, uh, than 64,000? So you don't run out of port exceptions. So should you have to dynamically build your snap pools? And should you dynamically have to be able to place your services so that they fail appropriately across your clusters? Yes. Think about, and by the way, the, the failing in an L2 cluster requires allowed address pairs in the reference implementation, right? Think about all the complexities of binding L2 and L3 in a fully clustered solution. We've orchestrated all that. Works great with the reference implementation. Works great with people who are ML2 compliant. If you're not, our agent has very distinct L2 and L3 bindings broken out. Why do you think that is? So you can tell me who you're working with so we can shake their hand and we can get it to work. Does that make sense? How many of you have OpenStack clouds that are not the reference implementation for your V switches. Oh, we love you guys. Um, little work to do. Tony, put your hand up. I know you do. <laughs> so but does this make sense to everybody? There's a lot. Devil's in the detail. You always appreciate that? The details are important, and we've worked very hard to make sure those details were covered. Now, what do we do behind, beyond LBAS? How many people want more features than what's in LBAS V1 or V2? How many people know that we support a lot more features than are beyond LBAS V1 or V2? Our devices do a lot more things than that. However, let's ask, are the underlying network primitives that are supported by LBAS V1 and V2 good enough for 80 plus percent of your use cases? Is it good enough to do the L2 binding and the L3 binding into Neutron? Yes. Now, what do you want us to do beyond that? Well, it would make sense that you'd want us to bring the full weight and bearer of F5's application proxies to OpenStack. So LBAS is one service definition. At F5, we have a templating language that we've spent a lot of time and money and energy to be able to do application service templates. It's called IAPS. So enterprise vendors for a long time have been working with us to say, I have this templated deployment that simplifies out how I do a complex application in a templated fashion for big IP. Now I'm going to ask, if we already have all the network primitives and all the plumbing and all the L2 and L3 plumbing done for OpenStack, do you think we should be planning on bringing our IAP templates as service definitions down to that plumbing? so that we can give you advanced services inside of OpenStack. That's the way your LBAS is running now. It's already a service definition. We prepped for that beginning. We built service definitions inside of Neutron. We pushed it out. The agent played it. Next step was move it to an IAP. Now that we have it in an IAP, do you think we can start templating other services for you? We can. So. In our little bit of time we had with you today, what we wanted you to appreciate is, one, network grafting into OpenStack and into the use cases and workloads that OpenStack could support isn't trivial. There's work to be done. We spent a lot of time doing that work across the F5 products. Two, on our virtual editions for NFE and for other things, there's a lot of work to be done to be able to say that we can onboard them correctly, make them look like proper OpenStack resources, not just a vendor resource. We've done that work. Where the community supports higher speed options, 
We've done that work. When you talk about other service definitions beyond LBAS that we can support with our application proxies, we have already architected our LBAS plugin to be able to take the top end of that service, replace it with another IAP, and fit on top of all the work we've done to cluster and get the plumbing right. Does that make sense to everybody? Did we do the right thing for you? We're trying. We're trying very hard to make sure that the full weight of advanced network services comes in a tested, supportable, across multiple platforms, your workload, your way type of service definition and deployment. That was our LBAS. It's a lot of work. Absolutely. <laughs> Do you guys have any questions? Nonstop. You have any questions about the specific stuff that's inside, the goodness? Please come see us if you do. Specifically, any questions you have about the SDN grafting or big IPs acting as full VTEPs inside of your clouds? Uh, specifically, questions about what do I do when my company has the following 12 services that I want to build into IAPs and I want to graft into OpenStack? Because we can tell you how we're working through that, specifically in private cloud. Okay? Um, we're taking the Red Hat model to that kind of, you know how Red Hat's the 90 day delay to watch the blood spill on it? So the answer to that is, come, no, we haven't released it. Have, oh yes, absolutely. Um, and, and so the LBAS V2 for us gives us more flexibility and even the next stuff that's coming for Liberty to be able to say that we've completely decoupled the pools and the VIPs. Again, for us, that's just another uh, reorganization of the service definition. Box does it. Right. 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 And, and we'll continue to keep up with what's released to be able to say that all of the standard services, of course, will work. Because if you just wanted to do LBAS, it's simple. We'd, we'd love to do that. If you want to do an advanced service, our, I guess our statement to you guys is let's, let's templatize it as an IAP and then graft it into the existing network architecture with Neutron that we've put together. Now, we're going to have to do proprietary solutions with proprietary SDN vendors that don't put all the data model in Neutron. We're going to do it. So as customers come to us and they say, hey, I've got this proprietary SDN vendor. I need you to go do this. We're going to work it into the model. I'm going to ask, once the SDN has been worked into that model, does that change the IAP at all? No. So are the services deployable across different SDN vendors? Sure. We just have to figure out how to do the L2 and L3 plumbing your way. The reference implementations are done. The ML2 implementations are done. And uh, it's worth mentioning that we have a partnership with Nuage, and we have a reference architecture right. to be included in their reference architecture. And there's documentation on, at our booth about uh, our Nuage integration. Right. And I have, to, I have to, I mean, I'll speak to that a little bit. Our, our friends at Nuage, too, were kind enough um, to say, hey, look, there's some of these API calls that we can simply support using the Neutron APIs and not make you do some things. And they've been very good to us to say, yes, those should be supported. For instance, allowed address pairs. A lot of address pairs should be a Neutron call. It doesn't necessarily have to be a proprietary call. So we're working with them, and we're always going to try to push into a community solution so that the API calls would look the same, whether you're using the reference implementation or something else. We will always try to promote that. Right. And it's good to see things like the L2 gateway right. that we can take advantage of, and uh, VLAN aware v uh, VMs, um, things like that, will allow us to expand our solution. And we're talking, we're talking with the folks that did the um, hierarchical port demonstration for, for you saw that, that presentation there for hierarchical port. So yeah, that if you Cumulus. didn't want us to be the VTEP, we could simply do VLAN taggings and let somebody else do that work. So we're going to try. We're going to try to be the community member and try to promote the open way of doing this, but still bring the richness of templated services to what you can do with our product. Make sense? Good. Thank you for your time. We appreciate the moments.